Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It's another edition of 153greatfish.com. It's uh, going to be an interesting day, uh, if you can say, uh, praise the Lord. Um, we have a concluding Bible study to our Hebrew series tonight. And I just wanted to say that uh, there's going to be a second broadcast that begins a little after 9 p.m. Central Standard Time tonight. Uh, this is optional. Uh, there's going to be something historic that's done on this channel. So you may want to watch. It'll be interesting for you. So praise the Lord. Uh, let's pray and ask Jesus to be part of our Bible study, shall we? Jesus, we love you, Lord. We praise you, mighty God. We ask you, Lord, to be part of this Bible study tonight. And Lord, let your word go forth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we go. We are in the book of Hebrews. This is part four of our study. And we're going to want to go to our outline right away. Now, remember lesson one, we had the seven truths in the book of Hebrews. And that Jesus was superior to Moses, but why? We answered that question. Jesus is the word, the sharp sword. That was all in lesson one. Then you're going to want to go to lesson two. Jesus is the higher high priest. Then lesson three talks about Melchizedek that Jesus is the better covenant and the surety of God's promises. Now, this box uh, popped up over here because this is lesson four tonight. This is the Heroes of Faith study and then an exhortation to Christian living. Let's go. The Heroes of Faith, that's what we're going to talk about first tonight. Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. At uh, the bottom of this slide, we're going to look at this word substance here and talk about it. Joshua 3 says this in verse 15, The feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the edge of the waters. They put their toes in, and the Jordan was full. It was overflowing all of its banks during the harvest time. And then the people passed over opposite to Jericho. How? The priests bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan. And all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the whole nation had completely passed over the Jordan. Uh, my wife and I were able to go to Israel in 1996, I believe it was. We went to the Jordan River. Many people were being rebaptized again. Once you've been baptized in Jesus' name, you never need to be baptized again because you crucify uh, God afresh because uh, uh, he removes sins permanently. And then you need only repent after that. But anyway, the Jordan River is, is not the widest river. It's not like the Mississippi. Uh, but when they put their toe in the water, it parted. Now, this is the point, that faith always begins with belief. Now, a word from Jesus goes from our heart to our head. That's belief. But it remains belief unless we do something with it. The devils believe and they tremble. <laughs> You're not saved by just believing. Faith must have an action. Those of you who think that water baptism is a work of the law, let me just tell you this. It's never found in the Old Testament. It's a work of faith. Just like moving your lips and praying or speaking is a work of faith. When you pray to God, you should pray to him audibly. That's a work of faith. So the word comes from Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. It goes to our heart, to our head, comes out our mouth and our actions. So faith occurs when the believer decides to act on the word of faith that's authored by Jesus. Faith comes in two ways. Here's the two ways. The first way is by hearing, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And the second way that faith comes, Luke 17, 1 through 5, offenses must come. <clears throat> Increase our faith, Lord, to reconcile. When you reconcile, you get greater faith. When you hear the word of God, you get greater faith deeper faith, the heroes of faith. So, I think this is a duplicate slide. It is. Anointing comes from deeper and wider faith. Faith begins with prayer time with Jesus. Commissioning of service begins with fasting. Jesus performed all of his miracles by faith as a man. Many people think that he performed these miracles as God. Now, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. 
godliness was manifest in the flesh. But Jesus was a man of faith. The key word here is man, son of God, son of man, as flesh. He had to have faith as well. The Bible says he learned obedience. And we know that obedience, that action, is faith. So his first miracle was the wine at the Cana marriage. And then he cast out devils. Healing of diseases. He healed the deaf, the blind, the palsy, the lady with the issue of blood. Healing was part of his faith ministry. Then he saw Nathanael sitting under a tree. And Nathanael said, you're the king of Israel. You're the son of God. That was a vision. He had a vision by faith. He multiplied the loaves and the fishes by faith. But notice, somebody had to give before the multiplication occurred. The priests always must stick their toe in the water first before the miracle happens. The interpretation of the law, Jesus gave this on the Sermon on the Mount. That was by faith. He walked on the water, then he calmed the Sea of Galilee by faith. He resurrected Lazarus by faith, and he decided with an action to go to the cross by faith. Jesus, if Jesus can do all these things by faith, then we can too. And finally, he prophesied of the temple's destruction by faith, just the way that we prophesy. Hebrews 12, 2 says this, Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He endured it, despising the shame. He is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God, which is the reward of faith, rulership, kingdom, power on earth, promised resurrection. That's a key point about faith. Now remember, these Hebrew Christians were thinking about backsliding, going back to Judaism. That's why whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, possibly Paul, possibly Barnabas, talks about these heroes of faith as examples to them of how they endured. So Abel offered a better sacrifice by faith than Cain did. Enoch, his faith pleased God. He was translated or raptured to heaven. He did not see death. Noah rescued his family in the animal kingdom, the whole world, by his faith to build the ark. Abraham left his home country, Shinar. God did not give him a map, but told him to look for a country, a land, and a city that God had promised. Sarah, by faith, when she was old, 99, she conceived her son Isaac at an old age, and the Bible says that all their body parts were dead. <laughs> it's funny how the Bible says this. Abraham, he was willing to sacrifice Isaac, his promise, when he was tried by God. And he believed, the writers of Hebrews said, that God would raise him from the dead if he did it. Isaac, by faith, blessed his sons for the future. He had faith in that blessing. Jacob, by faith, prophesied the future of his 12 sons. And some of that prophecy was not good. Joseph, by faith, prophesied the exodus from Egypt when he told them, when you leave, you must take my bones with you. And Jacob, Moses' mother, kept her male child three months from the Nile by faith and then put him in a basket. And Moses rejected royalty to dwell with the elites of his day, and he suffered with the Hebrew children. He despised his wealth, his education, for the cross of Christ. So, Hebrews 11 says this, And these all, these heroes, having obtained a good report through faith, they didn't receive the promise. God provides something better for us, because those before us could not be made perfect. So the promise that he's talking about that they did not receive was the promise of the Holy Ghost, which you and I have, plus the kingdom of God that comes with being born of the water and the spirit. That's how we enter the kingdom of God. All you Nicomedians out there, we must be baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Bible Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. That's the promise they did not have that we do. So let's continue with the heroes. Hebrews 11 says this, The heroes by faith did these things, conquered kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, that was Daniel, quenched the violence of fire, the Hebrew, three Hebrew children, escaped the edge of the sword. 
Out of weakness they were made strong. They fought valiantly in battles, causing armies of aliens to flee, Joshua. Women received their dead sons raised to life again. Talking about Elisha and Elijah, their miracles. And others were tortured. They did not accept deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings. That word scourgings means they were whipped, not just bonds of imprisonment. They were stoned, sawn asunder, the prophets Isaiah, tempted, slain by the sword. Many of them wandered destitute without clothes, afflicted and tormented. Why is the writer of Hebrews talking about this? Because these Jewish Christians thought they were suffering above and beyond what anybody was by being shunned and by persecution. They did not understand why persecution had come. We're going to read about that here in just a minute. You Jewish Christians, this letter is saying, your persecution does not amount to very much in comparison with the heroes of faith, what they went through. So Hebrews 12 says this, You have not yet resisted unto blood, but only striving against sin. That's your resistance. You must have forgotten this exhortation. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens every son whom he approves of. Why were they going through persecution, these Jewish Christians? Because God was perfecting them. He was making them sons, and they were learning righteousness. They were learning righteousness. That's what this writer is telling these Jewish Christians who were thinking about backsliding back to Judaism. They thought they couldn't take it no more. So now he gives them an exhortation. He says, now that you know that your persecution is a chastening to help us become Christ-like. He says, lift up your hands and worship. Be thankful for it. Follow peace with all men, not mean. Don't be mean to them. Follow peace with all men, which is what holiness is, which in turn permits men to see God in you. That's what he's telling them. You don't uh, be holy by uh, fighting with people. You follow peace with them. That's holiness. Then they see who Jesus is. Don't allow offenses or persecution to become bitterness inside of you, he exhorts. Don't be defiled by fornication. Don't sell your born-again birthright like Esau did. He sold it for a bowl of soup. He lost his blessing. And then when he wanted the blessing, he sought repentance with tears, but he could not find repentance. It's not guaranteed that God will grant repentance once you backslide. Christianity is not like the darkness of Sinai with fire, hail, a trumpet, and a fearsome voice. Those days are gone. And because they didn't have their sins remitted, everything sounded terrible, looked terrible. It, they said, we don't want God to speak to us. Let him speak to Moses. Even Moses was afraid. But Christianity is the real Mount Zion. It's the heavenly Jerusalem. It's surrounded by an innumerable cloud of witnesses, those heroes of faith and the angels who kept their first estate. Don't backslide is what he's saying. So, Hebrews 12, the city of Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. See that don't you don't refuse him as Jesus speaks. For if the people did not escape when they refused God on earth, talking about Korah, people like that, we certainly, us Christians, won't escape if we turn away from Jesus that speaks from heaven, whose voice, God's voice, once shook the earth. But now he not only shakes the earth, but also he's shaking heaven. And his point that he's making here is, will you be shaken out of the church? Will persecution shake you out of the church? Will shunning shake you out of the church? Or will you be like the people, the heroes of faith? Will you hang in there? That's the question that this book, this letter is asking. Here's our conclusion. He says this, since we received a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace. Let us serve God acceptably. Let's serve him with reverence and godly fear. For don't you remember, our God is a consuming fire. The same God on Mount Sinai is the same God that's in you, in me, through the Holy Ghost. Hebrews 13 then exhorts them to live like Christ. You can read that chapter on your own. That'll be your homework in this series. And then he says in Hebrews 13, 22, I ask you, brothers, tolerate this word, this book, this letter. Tolerate this word of exhortation, for I have written 
this letter in few words than I could have. I've written it in fewer words than I could have here from Italy. And then he concludes the book by saying, Timothy has been released from jail. Not all persecution lasts forever is what he's trying to tell him. So he, this man might have been Barnabas. He obviously could have been Silas. He obviously was a friend of Paul and Timothy. He was in Rome, most likely when he wrote this letter to Jewish Christians who are thinking about returning to Judaism. And he implores them, don't do it. Well, that's where we'll stop. Uh, I just want to say that it's, this letter is not just for Jewish Christians. It's for Gentile Christians as well. If you're thinking about going back to the bars, smoking weed, fornicating with somebody you're not married to, committing adultery, you're thinking about watching pornography, if you're thinking about doing these things, stealing, lying, going backwards, it's not guaranteed that God will give you repentance and let you come back. I knew one man who backslid, divorced his wife, okay, and then came back to Christ. And then he got offended by the preacher, backslid again. He's still out of the church. Friends, it's not guaranteed that God's going to let you come back. It's impossible, it says, to renew unto repentance and crucify Christ afresh. You won't be able to repent and get baptized again. But God will give you grace if you seek him. He'll let you back in. But don't fall away the next time. All right. Thank you for uh, being patient with this Bible study tonight. I just want to remind everybody who's watching live from the webpage, if you will log in again at 9 a.m., you are going to see something historic that most likely has never been done before. I'm just going to put that out there. Uh, it's not required that you attend. It's not a lesson. It's not a study. But it is something that's going to be very interesting. God bless you in Jesus' name. We'll see you again here on another edition of 153greatfish.com.